Hello, everybody. We're waiting a couple minutes to make sure people can join from the wait room and for those who come a couple minutes late. Meanwhile, if you feel like it, you can put uh, your name and location or just location in the chat. It's always nice to know where people are calling in from. Oh, UK. <laughs> My goodness, Nairobi. India. Yes. If you're just joining us, we're waiting a couple minutes to make sure people can be admitted from the waiting room. And then we'll get started at around 12.05. All right, I, I think we can go ahead. It looks like we have critical mass. Um, so welcome to today's reading and conversation with Mitu Sanyal and Priscilla Lane. My name is Elisabeth Krima. I'm at UC Davis and I'm co-organizing this series together with Professor Denis Gurkturk of the University of California, Berkeley. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, when we started this series, we worked with the consulate in San Francisco, and currently uh, the series is being sponsored by the Goethe Institute San Francisco. And we also have the support of the Pacific Office of the German Historical Institute. And so I want to thank all of those involved because they're really making it possible for us to do this. Um, I would also like to announce that, as always, there will be time for questions from the audience toward the end. We ask that you put questions in the chat and we will tell you when it's time to do so, probably at around 1, 1.10, um, depending on how, how we're doing here. Um, I should also say that we're planning on continuing the series in fall. I don't have specific announcements yet, but uh, it's in the works and is being planned right now. So we'll dive right in. Um, the topic of today, let me show it, is this book, Identity. Um, and before we begin, we have a student of Priscilla's who's actually currently working on this novel, who will do today's introductions. Uh, her name is Ther Teresa Sambruno Spanhoff. So Teresa. Thank you very much. So um, Mito Sanya is an award-winning novelist, academic, critic, and broadcaster who writes about sex, gender, post-colonialism, power structures, and racism. Sanya stud studied German and English literature at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. Her first book, A Cultural History of the Vulva, appeared with Fella Klaus Wagenbach under the title Vulva, die Enthüllung des unsichtbaren Geschlechts. Her second book, Vergewaltigung, in English, Rape from Lucretia to Me Too, 
was published by Edition Nautilus. She has written numerous articles and radio plays for the Westdeutsche Rundfunk, Deutschlandfunk, the Bayerische Rundfunk, Die Zeit, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Frankfurter Rundschau, Taz, and The Guardian. In 2021, she published her first novel, Identity, Identity, with Karl Hansa, which was shortlisted for the German Book Prize. The translation is forthcoming with Astra House in the US and b &Q Books in the UK. Priscilla Lane is Associate Professor of German and Adjunct Associate Professor of African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her book, White Rebels in Black, German Appropriation of Black Popular Culture, was published in 2018 by the University of Michigan Press. She has also published essays on Turkish German culture, translation, punk, and film. She recently translated Olivia Wenzel's debut novel, 1017 Angst, which will be out in June. And she is currently finishing a manuscript on Afro-German Afrofuturism and a critical guide to Fassbinder's The Marriage of Maria Brown. And with that, I pass on to the speakers. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Teresa. And thank you, Frau Sanyal. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I already you know, told you how much I love loved your novel. Um, and I was really especially surprised with how much it resonated with the American, with American discourse around identity and race. Um, and um, also being someone in academia, how you captured the kind of personalities one can find, you know, among faculty and students. Um, so I'd like to start with a question about one of your main characters um, before you read your first excerpt of the novel. Um, so one of the most interesting figures in the book is uh, Shahaz Fati, uh, the author of Decolonize Your Soul, who routinely asks white students to get out of her seminars. Uh, she is, one could describe her as highly narcissistic uh, and completely unapologetic. And she maintains that her brown facing further a progressive agenda since race is a construct anyway. Um, so she, she also refuses to be ashamed of her behavior vis-a-vis um, -vis not only uh, her racially coded identity, but also her gender. Um, at the same time, she's capable of great empathy. So I was wondering, would you describe uh, Sharaswati as both an anti-heroine and a heroine? <laughs> Oh, that's a lovely, lovely question. I have never been asked that question before, but um, I want it just to, to fulfill the love fest because I'm, I'm a fan of Olivia Wenzel's book and I'm so excited that you translated it. So that is amazing. And that's an amazing book anyway. So it's great that it's there in English soon. Um, Sharaswati is obviously, yes, sorry. <coughs> Welcome to the Corona Lectures. So I might have to cough a bit. I, I'm supposed <laughs> to be recovered, but um, I'm still coughing. Um, obviously, yes, um, I, I think usually anti-heroes are heroes anyway, because um, they get most of our attention. And I put a lot of energy into making her ambivalent. So um, people have been telling me that they really hated her. And then they thought, well, maybe she's right. And then a couple of pages later, they thought, she is awful. And that was a lot of work because it would have been easier to make her just a monster. She's done something. Everybody's upset about that. So um, all the people in the book concerned are upset, but they're all upset for different reasons because they all come with their own stories, their own personal histories. They all come with their bodies. That's the one one of the things. They uh, um, it impacts them physically, all of them. And her favorite student, Nivedita, she's more heartbroken. She wants answers from her. And her other student, Luci, she wants her to be thrown out of university. So that's kind of the spectrum in this. And um, my American publisher told me oh um this is a problem because in america at the end you've got to say who's right and who's wrong and this is what the book does not do and it that's basically one of the most important things in the book it doesn't tell you this was wrong it tells you this is how it impacts people and so the book is not a kind of um crimi it's not about is Sharaswati white is she brown um you get told that 
uh, the debunking happens at the end of the first chapter. And then it's all about what do people do with that? What does it do to people? Um, also, um, is there is there any kind of life after being <laughs> debunked? So life after the shitstorm. Um, what about forgiveness? What would be um, the prerequisites? You can't, everybody wants forgiveness all the time. They say, oh, you, but you've got to, got to love each other again. But something's got to happen before that. And usually people want to jump that process and it's all about that process and i've got to cough i'm so sorry <coughs> and um you're right the the book is translated into into english and it's a brilliant translation and i've been asked to read a bit in english as well so i'm going to try to do that and i'm not sure whether i'll succeed because it's a different rhythm to mine so um i've got my own rhythm in my hand and and, and i i send you a lot of things i wanted to read and then i decided i want to read um my my american <laughs> bit so i'm going to read a different part and so just to make everything more difficult for you so <laughs> you okay so thank sorry. you keeping me on my toes <laughs> <laughs> exactly um if it doesn't work i um, i just switch to german but i don't know how many people speak german who are listening in so maybe it's quite boring <laughs> listening to me online droning on in german so yeah fine um, so Nivedita goes and visits Sharaswati in her flat. She's got a flat at the top of a house, a kind of penthouse in Oberberg. That's one of those um, parts of town where most migrants live. And it's a kind of she's down in the hood. And so she is um, she's moved into her flat. I'm so sorry about this. <coughs> so she's moved into her flat for three weeks. Um, at the end of the first night, Sharaswati's um, lover comes around, Tony comes around. Tony is kind of incredibly white, so she's got slight albinism, so she's whiter than white. And um, and, and 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 stays there too, and in the in the course of the book, more and more people join them in that flood while outside the shitstorm is raging. And so um, this is Sharaswati speaking, and she says, oh, the idea... Um, of the critique of cultural appropriation contains a broad range of possibilities spanning from highly useful to highly destructive, um, which is just an answer to Nivedita saying, but you told me about the concept of cultural appropriation. And then Nivedita answers, oh, and I suppose you're the one who decides exactly where on that broad range of possibilities you stand right. Shadow Shrek, and why not? After all, even Barack Obama was given the right to choose to be black. Barack who? Obama, 44th president of the United States, but that was before your time. Ha ha. Shadaswati's fingers twitched as if she were about to grab her dupatta, they said dupatta, which Nivedita had come to recognize as a sign she, that she was about to launch into a lecture. His mother was white. He grew up in a white family. He attended an elite white university. He even lived in the goddamn White House, for Christ's sake. What more does one have to do to be white? But he's, he looks black, Nivedita protested. Q-E-D. Shadaswati's fingers butted open as if blossom, 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 blossoming. This is a spelling mistake in the translation. Sorry. Q-E-D, are you fucking kidding me? Why? How? And where's the difference? He didn't need to resort to some wacky herbal skin treatment to look the way he looks. Ah, herbal treatments. Sharaswati dreamily effused. I don't even want to know. Nivedita cut off. So what do you want to know then? Why you, why can never be separated from how? But you grew up with all the benefits of white privilege, Nivedita said. Boy, oh boy, are you ever overestimating whiteness, baby, said Sharaswati, slinking back down into a lounger. Boy, oh boy, are you ever, and since Nivedita couldn't come up with the right noun form of POC, she switched gears underestimating what it's like to grow up in this country as a non-white kid. You aren't the only one who's experienced exclusion here. Yeah, well, just for the time being, the candle flickered and flared, hissing like a cat, and then calmed back down. It's like a ghost just walked by, said Sharaswati. The ghost of the years past in Sharaswati's classes, thought Nivedita. But then she realized it was Kali. Kali is the goddess Kali who is basically playing a role in the book and always interfering in Nivedita's mind. Kali had finally come back and was now crouching on the end of her lounger, 
following this endless debate between Nividita and not Nividita. You simply didn't have the same experience as a kid growing up, knowing that you were never, ever included, always excluded. Nividita was growing more determined. You don't know what it's like when none of the cultural messages is meant for you or anyone like you. You don't know what it's like to never be in the system, to always be on the outside looking in. Oh, baby, Sharaswati said. And those two words sounded less like they meant, oh, little one, more like they meant, oh, you newborn, or maybe slightly less weirdly, oh, you really were born yesterday. You don't seriously believe that the experience of being excluded is limited to a set of skin color, do you? Of course I was never included. People like me who are born into a skin that doesn't match the one they feel as theirs are never included because people like me aren't supposed to exist. Nividita was taken aback, but, sti but still she had to speak up. It's not the same. No two experiences ever are the same. Well, asked Carly, what are you going to say to that? Yeah, what should I say to that? Nividita asked Carly back. Carly raised her hands up and suddenly Nividita knew exactly what she wanted to say. That's all well and good for, you, good for you as a private individual, but not as a professor and public figure. How is it that you could only teach post-colonial studies? In a perfect imitation of Carly's gesture, Shadaswati raised her hands up. Because although no two experiences are ever exactly the same, we can nevertheless learn from other people's experiences. It's a magical phenomenon known as empathy. Nivedita knew there was a mistake somewhere in there. She just didn't know exactly where. Where? Stop qualifying everything. Not everything is relative. And why shouldn't you have more empathy for my position, huh? After all, I sure feel a lot of empathy for you. <laughs> sure is, but you don't know what you're talking about when you talk about empathy. You aren't capable of empathizing with anyone except your own books, Tony said, sitting down next to her. By candlelight, her hair was the same color as the white hand towel with which she was rubbing it dry. Nividita opened her mouth in order to count her Shadowsati's last remark, but something else entirely came out. Simon dumped me. I had a sneaking suspicion you weren't here for purely altruistic reasons, Shadowsati purred. Altruism is one of the most misunderstood concepts, Carly noted. Except race, said Nividita. Except race, right, Carly concurred. Except gender, Tony's white silhouette seemed to add. Except Shadaswati always needed to make an exception for herself. But the pain you're feeling from the breakup has nothing to do with Simon. Simon's just a trigger. The pain is older and deeper. What fortune cookie did you lift that one from? Nivedita was stunned at how easily she kept being stunned. So if I'd had a happy childhood, I wouldn't feel hurt that he left me. No, because in that case, you wouldn't ever have been with him in the first place. Shariswati, did you hear what I said? He dumped me. He's no longer with me. He might not be, but you still are. She's right, Tony casually chimed in. I'm taking her side because she's so goddamn smart. Tony, did you, did you get the memo on what a total mess she's made of her life, Nividita countered. End of her career, she added, the last bit out of spite and Shadaswati had hurt her. Why are you madder at me than you had Simon? Shadaswati was rapt as she awaited the answer. Because I trusted you, Nividita howled, thinking, it's true. The reason I'm so mad at her is because I actually trusted her. Maybe it's high time you trusted your life partner too. Wouldn't that be a laugh? That's precisely my point. And then Shadowsati got up from her lounge and hugged Nividita with four arms. Shadowsati's body was soft and still warm from the heat of the day, but also already cool in the night air. Her body was like a bridge between this exact the summer and all the summers that had gone before. All the summers Nividita had experienced in her entire lifetime, as well as all the summers she had never experienced, but that had nevertheless made her who she was. All those invisible, parallel plane of existence summers that had still given her the vitamins and nutrients she needed in order to grow. They had become her very bones and had also created the political fault lines and forces that had compelled her ancestors to leave their various countries of origin and head elsewhere in search of home, education, work, love, and recognition for their specific individuality 
as human beings on this planet. And then Ivedita noticed that two of Sharasati's arms were brown as cedarwood, while the other two were oh so snow white and still damp from the shower. What Simon did isn't racist, but the fact that it got so completely under your skin has a whole lot to do with racism, the very brown Sharasvati said. And in the lingering heat of now morphing into a tropical night, Sharasvati could almost, sorry, <laughs> and in the lingering heat of day, now morphing into a tropical night, Nivedita could almost understand what that meant. Always nice to <laughs> fuck up the punchline. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's interesting to hear it in English since I, I haven't seen this translation yet. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, that actually, that scene sets up a perfect transition to my next question, um, which is about uh, Nivedita. Um, so I feel like when, when we're first introduced to her in the novel, I feel like you, she seems very like idealistic. You know, she's she's a almost militant, you know, in her views, and we get these posts from her blog, you know, um, and it seems like you know social media people, especially like enjoy this uh, side of her personality. But then I was really struck by the fact that when the secret comes out about Sharasvati, she's the one who withholds judgment. So she's the the first one to say, "Wait, you know, she wants to find out more." Um, so I was wondering, what is it, would you say, about uh, Nivedita's personality, or is it something about her relationship with Sharasvati that allows her to, to suspend her judgment in that moment? Well, the problem for Nivedita is that Sharasvati kind of gave her permission to be herself. So what we need to know about Nivedita is she's mixed race. So um, her mother is, well, from Polish descent, so second generation Polish. Her father is Indian. She grows up in Germany. And there, um, we haven't got the concept of being mixed race in German. Um, so um, we, we say, oh, you're half Indian, which is race ideology. So which half of me is Indian, the right one, the left one? Um, so if one of your parents is, is Indian, then you're half, and if one of your grandparents, then you're quarter. So this is pure race ideology. Um, and we have not talked about race in Germany because of fascism. So we kind of, of um, were very, very scared of that subject. And it's just come up in the last, well, in mainstream, obviously. Uh, everybody has been talking about it um, in academia and in, in activist circles. But in the mainstream, maybe five years ago. And um, we're just grappling with all these concepts. And we have not got an idea of a, a, also post-migrant um, literature that kind of does not exist. It's just emerging. And Olivia Wenzel is one of those. Um, so we have this idea that people who look like me or, or you, if you were here, would have to come from somewhere else. So we could have, um, you must have been born somewhere else. The idea that people can be born here um, and, and just be German and German plus is a new idea. And being mixed race is even, even harder to grasp because um, when I grew up, and that's um, something that happens to Nivedita's parents in the book as well. Um, my parents were warned, I oh, don't have a child because those children are more unstable. They'll have depression in later life. You know, this, this mixing makes them <laughs> kind of, it's, it's bullshit. Um, and, and so um, she doesn't feel she belongs to either Poland nor India, nor Germany. And then Sharaswati, and everybody tells her you're not authentic enough. And she, she genuinely feels she isn't authentic enough. She's got a cousin, Preeti, who has got two Indian parents. She's got a mother in a sari, and that's kind of what she always thinks, oh, Preeti can tell me whether I'm Indian enough or not. And Preeti obviously calls her coconut because that's what you call people when, when, you, when you're looking for the weak spot they they know each other since they were children so she don't doesn't mean that it's just the way she knows oh she'll react to that and then Sharas Gotti comes along and says there is no authenticity so there's no right way to live in 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 the post-empire world so you can invent yourself and she shows her another way of being Indian so in Germany you grow up as India um all these um advertisements for rice for India so all the Indians are starving which they haven't done since independence by the way there were no famines in India since independence which we tend to forget um um, so famines have a lot to do with colonization and, and all those after effects. And so 
when Sharasvati, if Sharasvati is not Sharasvati, then Nivedita is Nivedita. So her whole concept of herself is breaking down. And um, she's also kind of in love with Sharaswati, but in, in love like you with a role model. Like, you know, it, it, when the, because she's young, everything is, is tinted with eroticism, but um, it's not a, an erotic love. It is the love that you've got for a role model, for a mother figure and all that. So um, if she lets go of that, there's nothing left over. And her boyfriend, Simon, had just dumped her. So she is at the loose end. She... At the beginning of the book, she gives an interview and she's talking about Sharaswati, and that's before the debunking. And, but the interview is aired afterwards, and she says things like, Oh, people who accuse Sharaswati of race and just don't understand her, and they don't understand what whiteness means for Sharaswati. So this is completely misunderstood. So she gets a lot of the shitstorm as well. So her whole community is against her. Um, her boyfriend has just dumped her, and her cousin Preeti who's also her best friend is somehow involved in the process of debunking she doesn't know exactly how so and then Sharaswati calls and says come around and and this is her chance and she goes there in the way that people after the end of a relationship say oh let's talk because she wants to talk it through as often as possible until Sharaswati is brown again basically she hopes if we talk about it long enough it won't have happened and then being there she also realizes that Sharaswati is still Sharaswati. She's still given her everything that was important for her and she's done something awful. And then she tries to kind of bring these two things that can't be in the same, these two concepts just don't, don't seem to belong to each other. And she, she tries to bring them into communication. And she also tries to get us, gets answers because she tries to find out why has, have you done this? And Sharaswati loves that because she loves talking about herself. So she gives her loads of answers never the answers that Nivedita wants to hear, but loads and loads of answers. And in the course of the book, obviously, there, there are cracks in Sharaswati's armor, and you find out there is a reason for why she's done that. It's not just that she thought that's a cool thing to do. Um, you can still ask whether it's the right decision, but um, she has got a personal history. There's a lot of, she has got skin in the game, a lot of skin in the game. Yeah, no, um, uh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, first, I was thinking of your comment about embodiment and everyone bringing their body to the discussion. Um, yeah, that's one thing I really appreciate about Sharaswati is that by learning her personal history, that she has trauma, that there is a reason why she's become who she's become, I feel like it, it's a reminder um, to students that faculty are that we're people, you know, that we have these personal history and trauma, you know, because sometimes you can kind of feel like, I don't know, you're, you're this like two dimensional robot almost, you know, when you're teaching. Um, I also am drawn to what you said about authenticity. Uh, and I can see why uh, this idea of rejecting all authenticity could be um, attractive to Nivedita. Because I have to say, this is one of the things that really resonated with me about the novel. I was shocked at how much Nivedita's experience uh, mirrored my own, <laughs> even though, you know, I'm not- Amazing. <laughs> so I'm not Indian, but my parents are from the Caribbean. And so I have, I was born in the US. My parents were born in the Caribbean. I have relatives in England, you know? So this whole, this, this um, experience of being in the diaspora and constantly being told by all sides, you're not authentic. I, I know what that feels like. So yes, I would love to just reject it. I'm surprised at how, how much it still affects me, even as an adult. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so this oh. is also, that's the problem because um, if people say authentic, they also mean conservative. So um, the kind of Indianness that she would have to personify would be a very, um, she says, a Sita Indianness. Sita is this um, a mythological um, wife of Rama, a goddess, and, and she is very chaste and does always the right thing and, and, and sacrifices herself. And, and she's awful. <laughs> I mean, she is amazing. And, 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 um, but Nivedita would rather be like Kali, like this, um, this goddess and who's destructive and naked and black. And, 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 and she, she, um, she does not have sex in the missionary position, she's sitting on, on her partner or lying atop or him. And um, so 
Uh, but this is not the kind of Indianness she is allowed to be because that is westernized, so to speak. And so um, any kind of queerness is um, is kind of um, put back to um, um, mirrored back to that, that is westernized, which is actually not the case. I mean, if you look at history it's the other way around so the british came to india and they the first goddess they encountered was kali and they um who was like i said who who was sitting on top who was straddling her man and they said oh we have to colonize india because we've got to free these poor women from having to do these awful sexual practices it's all for women's rights that's the only reason that's a white man's burden to colonize and um and also they um in india we have three genders so we've got men women and hijra so the first thing is said oh hijra's criminal tribe they're all criminals and now we kind of go there and say oh we've invented trans we've invented the concept of trans let us show you and let us show you sexual um the sexual revolution and oh homosexuality you are so backwards you should embrace homosexuality and all the laws against homosexuality in those colonial countries are colonial laws that were brought in either by the British or the French or whoever was there. And so India legalized homosexuality in 2018, the same year as Germany legalized it. We always <laughs> tend to forget that. Yeah, no, those are great points on what you said about um, colonial India made me think of, uh, I think this is a quote from Spivak, who you mentioned at the end of the book, but uh, that colonialism, the colonial project is white men protecting brown women from brown men, right? Um, and yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it's interesting if, if we really interrogate our assumptions about um, you know, sexual practices in these former colonies, that a lot of times we find that um, a lot of homophobic ideas, for example, are, are introduced by by the colonizer. And I think of, for example, Jamaica, you know, and their, their issues with homophobia and also a former British colony. Um, so uh, one thing, one moment that really um, stood out to me in the novel um, is when the terror attack in Hanau happens. And it, it really felt like a, like a visceral shift, a shift in mood when that happens. Um, and then uh, in your kind of afterward to the book, uh, you talk about, you know, the importance of including that, um, you know, why that was important to you. Um, so I had a couple of questions about that. Um, first, um, for me, that the Hanau incident uh, resonated with something that Olushi um, said about the existential fear that comes with being a black or a person of color in Germany. And so as much as I enjoyed Sharaswati's like ambivalence and you know her the way that she reinvented herself, this is often a point that I make when my students say to me, do you think you can change your race? You know, can you do this? I always say, well, for me, there, there is a certain white privilege that comes with saying, I am now POC or I am now black, because first of all, I say, well, I can't do it the other way around. You know, I can't say to the policeman that stops me, oh, you know, I'm actually white. <laughs> Although I have seen a black man with a t-shirt at protests that say, I am a white woman, <laughs> which is maybe, well, I, you I know. think I actually know, was it Ronnie Ryan, Ryan Gladden? Oh, I don't know. I, I saw it. I think I saw it at one of the protests around when the George Floyd incident happened. Yeah. <laughs> but um, oh, so so for me, I always tell students that I feel like there's a certain existential fear of a physical threat that comes with being black or a person of color that you can't necessarily just, you know, adopt, like if you were to change your identity. So I was curious what you thought about that. Um, but I also wanted to refer to your comments in the, at the end of the book, you say that not, not enough German authors have written about these kinds of incidents, this, you know, physical racial terror um, that people of color in Germany face. Do you still feel like that's the case? Have, have things gotten any better, you, you know, maybe perhaps since 2020 and, and the George Floyd discourse? Um, and now it was actually the other way around that um, when my book appeared, quite a lot of other German novels appeared with the same 
theme and and so it was kind of like a morphogenetic field so it is time to talk about this and before it was like it was weird i mean we were talking about people um <clears throat> crossing the border from eastern germany so so um, um crossing the wall and all this and i've never experienced that myself and i haven't got any any relatives but obviously i read these novels because it's part of our story so so we need to have those stories in our literature to to mourn to remember for all of these reasons and and also because they are our history and so it was incredible that at the same time there were so many terrorist racist terrorist attacks against um well non-white germans so um and and they were not in literature they didn't have um they didn't have an echo in literature and that was so um shocking and not in the literature that was widely um reviewed and there might have been a book that i've overlooked because it was kind of marginalized obviously that is all possible and so it was kind of i always knew i wanted to end with a racist terrorist attack um because one of the reasons i wrote i i, I um not i wrote the book but one of the um the inspirations for shadow Swati was obviously the rachel dollarzal case and that ended with this white supremacist going to the church in charleston and shooting i think nine black people and um so i knew and it was i think three weeks after so um so afterwards you couldn't talk about the case in the same way so it changed the conversation and i knew this was to be my narrative arch it would basically end there and then there's another bit nine months later because obviously time goes on even after this time goes on life goes on and so um i i, I wanted to invent one because there, there are loads of, of parallel cases in germany and then while i was writing hannah didn't happen that's the wrong word so so um that guy went into two shisha bars in hana and just shot at people who did look like the people Sharaswati was kind of cosplaying, trying to impersonate, trying to inhabit. Um, and that changed my life for a couple of weeks. So I was online looking at that and I was talking to people about it. And that was the main topic of conversation. And then I met a very, very good friend going shopping um, at the supermarket. And she said, how are you? And I said, awful. And she said, why and and a white friend obviously and that was and she is such a close friend and she's even the person in the book she is she i ask quite a lot of people to kind of have um have kind of cameo roles in the book so she's barbara in the book and um and and i suddenly noticed it's not as central to her and she is left wing of course she knew what had happened but it wasn't the most important um thing in her life at that time and so i suddenly lived in two worlds with my 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 black and and P, uh, poc friends and with my white friends and i thought this is also literature's fault that we, we haven't got those shared histories and and i thought i want to put her now in and then i thought can you do that can you use other people's pain for your own literature and i i talked to loads of people about every aspect in the book and I still made loads of mistakes as you do and I talked to people from Hana and asked them what do you think about that and Hana actually it they are not in Hana they just see it in the media so they they, they hear it in the news and they read about it and they obviously they look at it online because it, they can't think about anything else it's a very short section um and I decided I want I don't want to invent something I want to put the real incident and i want to put the real names and i want to like this say their names i want to have some kind of monument for these people in the book very 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 small obviously but that was important to me and at the same time other people were doing similar things in literature and some made it, um made it uh, made up well, similar things and and some people used real incidents and that was amazing kind of time was up to speak about that in our literature so yes something has happened um, and it was not the same. It was a bit like that with George Floyd. I was so grateful that so many people went to the streets and, and that was amazing, especially during Corona time. So I hadn't seen anybody and suddenly there were these massive sensation. You were going with loads of people and they're all around you. And this is a different world. This is the world from before. This is kind of normality. But there have been similar cases in Germany and people don't know about them. And there's also a reason for that. So we don't know about all the deaths in police custody 
and all that. And it is not a coincidence that we know so much more what goes on in America than what goes on in Germany. And it's very important that we should know about our own history. Yeah, thank you so much for those comments. Um, I think now's a good time to read another excerpt. Uh, I'll read a short excerpt in German. So if it's too mm -hmm. boring, then I'll switch to English. <laughs> and then we, we have lots of German professors in the audience. So Brilliant. They, they can have Brilliant. It. And I'll do, I do a fake British accent in between. <laughs> so it's more, <laughs> it's more fun for you. Um, this is um, this is um, uh, another time when Nivita has just been left by her boyfriend Simon. It's a flashback, and um, what do we need to know? So she takes a taxi. Even taxis are in the same category category for her as inland flights. And um, Gwyneth Paltrow's "This smells like my vagina" candle, even though vaginas don't smell. <laughs> it's physically impossible. Vulvas can smell, but vaginas just can't. Um, and what do we need to know? So um, uh, Preeti is her cousin. She comes from Birmingham and she is in, in um, Germany now as well, studying with Shadaswati. Nivedita's parents are called Birgit and Jagdish Anand. And the first thing the, the taxi driver asked her, obviously, is where do you come from? And Nivedita answers, aus Polen. Aus Polen, fragt der Taxifahrer. Aus Polen, bestätigt die Nivedita. Und wo kommt die Mama her? Aus Polen. Aus Polen? Aus Polen. Das Taxi fuhr durch die Unterführung Hüttenstraße und sie waren in Oberbilk und damit zu Hause. Und der Papa? Aus Indien, kapitulierte Nividita. Das ist ja eine originelle Mischung. Nividita bezweifelte, dass das bei der Entscheidung ihrer Eltern für ein Kind eine Rolle gespielt hatte. Wir würden gerne einmal möglichst originell mischen. Außerdem war im Ruhrgebiet die Mehrheit der Bevölkerung sowieso in irgendeiner Generation polnisch. Birgit war eine geborene Schimanski. Das hatte Nividita als Kind immer für eine besondere Ironie gehalten, da Birgit Anand dem berühmten Horst Schimanski so überhaupt nicht ähnelte. Doch mit zunehmendem Alter, also seit ihrem ersten Freund, war ihr klar geworden, dass der himmelblauäugige Tatortpolizist Schimanski mit seinen weichen Trenchcoats und den harten Sprüchen genau die Sorte Mann war, die Birgit attraktiv fand. Rauchend wie Simon und saufend nicht wirklich wie Simon und Deutsch wie Simon. Und Nividita begann zu rätseln, wie Birgit und Jaktisch Anand jemals zusammengekommen waren. Doch für Birgit war Tato Cimanski nicht deutsch. Ich kann mich noch genau daran erinnern, wie ich ihn das erste Mal im Fernsehen gesehen habe. Das war 1979, nee, 81. Are you still there? Somebody is frozen. Oh gut, sorry. <lacht> das war 1979. Nee, 81. Für Birgit war genau eine relative Angabe. Ein polnischer Kommissar. Du kannst dir gar nicht vorstellen, welche Vorurteile es damals gegen Polen gab. Wie viele Polen braucht man, um eine Glühbirne auszuwechseln? Wetten, die Glühbirne wird geklaut? Hö, hö. Dass ein Pole kriminal Hauptkommissar sein konnte und nicht krimineller. Das war... <lacht> Wir haben noch echten Rassismus erlebt. Es ist so toll, dass es so etwas heute nicht mehr gibt. Jedes Mal, wenn Birgit diese Geschichte wiederholte und sie wiederholte sie ständig, überlegte Nividita, ob sie ihrer Mutter an die Gurgel gehen sollte. Alternativ sagt auch ihr Vater ihr gerne, dass er noch echten Rassismus erlebt habe. Doch wenigstens leugnete er nicht, dass es heute noch Rassismus gab. Nur hielt er ihn für minderwertigen Rassismus. So wie er auf das Wort Mikroaggressionen in der Regel mit großen Aggressionen reagierte. Was ist dein Problem mit deiner Mitbewohnerin Lotte? Lotte trägt Bindi, ha? was soll dein Problem sein? Daran verdienen ein indischer Bindi-Hersteller und ein indischer Bindi-Exporteur. Schon mal drüber nachgedacht? Ha? Wir hatten noch Angst, auf der Straße zusammengeschlagen zu werden. Damals gab es richtigen Rassismus. Nicht so einen Sonnenschein-Rassismus wie heute. Nividita schaute ihn an und dachte an all die Dinge, für die er keine Sprache hatte und hatte keine Sprache, sie ihm zu erklären. Also versuchte sie, sie Priti zu erklären, als sie in der Uni auf die Ankunft von Shadaswati warteten, die wie üblich zu spät zu ihrem eigenen Seminar erschien. Ich wünschte, ich wäre als indisches Mädchen in England aufgewachsen. Dort gibt es wenigstens eine Community und kulturelles Wissen über uns, während hier... Nividita brach ab, als Priti ihren Ringordner auf den Tisch knallte. 
you Germans but are um, kushalig and klein and racismus. You have no idea about racism before you fash or England comes. Ratama barob ich da weg bin. Germanistan ist ein Puppenhaus dagegen. Und was ist mit dem NSU und, und mit Uriallo? wandte Nividita, die in mit Schirm, Charme und Melone Verehrung für England aufgewachsen war, vorsichtig ein. Like I said, ein Puppenhaus gegen das, was wir jeden Tag erdulden müssen, sagte Priti und sah dabei weder besonders geduldig noch besonders beschädigt aus und auch nicht so, als wüsste sie, wer Uriallo oder der NSU waren. Well, that's, it's so interesting because I never thought of Priti as having a, a British accent. <laughs> When I read the text, I always just heard it in, per, in the German, accent freies Deutsch. So yeah, but it makes sense, right? She's from Birmingham. Um, yeah, the, wow, there's so, so much I could ask about that um, excerpt. And the beginning uh, is one example, I think, of the humor that Elizabeth Uh, indicated and I have heard that I've had a similar exchange in Germany because I also hear the wo kommst du her and when I say America then it's aber wo kommen deine Eltern her so it's like this this constant you ha they have to get to the source like you said you cannot possibly be like from the west there must be some like origin you know yeah uh, and that yeah. it's not a question of where do you come from it's a question of why are you black or why are you brown <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. So, yeah, here it's interesting that you're hearing about Birgit's um, uh, her own identity. We see that uh, Nivedita sees her mother as just white, but her mother seems to understand herself as a, an ethnic minority, right? That she's from Poland. And considering all the anti-Slavism in Germany's history, you know, you could say that the mother is also a kind of racialized minority. Um, in Germany. Absolutely. And I mean, we, we always forget Poland was a German colony. So we have got mm -hmm. a colonial history with Poland. We've also got a colonial history with Turkey. And we don't speak mm -hmm. about that. If we speak about German colonialism at all, we speak about Namibia and, and all this. So we've got this salt water theory. So here's the motherland mm -hmm. and there's a colony. There's a lot of water in between. And mm -hmm. um, we don't look at especially what what um, we did to um, to Uh, Eastern Europe and um, most of the crime, not most, but, but quite a lot of the crimes of uh, of the Nazis happened in Poland. So the big cassettes were there. So Auschwitz, all the ones we know about were in Poland. So, and there's a lot of trauma and history there that we just don't look at. And also um, this part of Germany is based on migration. A lot of it is migration from Poland coming to the coal mines in the Ruhr Valley. So the Ruhr Valley was basically all the families have got a name that ends in ski. <laughs> so, <laughs> Shimanski. And, and my mum, um, her, her maiden name is Dagothki, obviously. And um, my mother, for example, she always wanted to get rid of her surname. So she married my father and, and then she was called Zanya. And in Germany, if you've got an Indian surname, it's a lot harder to get a flat. It's a lot harder to get a job, everything. But after they separated, they separated when I was already had already moved out and she kept his surname. And that told me a lot in hindsight about the racism that she had experienced as a Polish kid. And they called her the N-word. So it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So that the that Polish people, if you haven't got any black people, you you find someone that you basically categorize as that. That is amazing. I mean <laughs> Well, actually, you, you could say the same about the U.S., that there is a kind of a hierarchy when it comes to ethnicities and, and immigrants. And usually, you know, yeah, it's easiest to make fun of the Blacks, right? But if there are none, then you go to the next uh, group. And actually, I'm from Chicago, which is, I think, has the largest Polish population outside of Warsaw. We have a lot of Polish immigrants. I grew up hearing Polish jokes, right? So the same kind of anti-Slavism uh, you will find in the U.S. It's it's interesting how how those stereotypes travel. Um, And it's oh, also so that whiteness isn't hasn't always been equally white. So some people mm -hmm. are supposed to be not as white as others and mm -hmm. and these um the system changed during time and also there's um 
the the story about Obama goes on that um, because Obama's black parentage, um, his father came from Kenya, and so he didn't have the experience of slavery in his family. And then they did DNA mm -hmm. tests on his mum, and they found out there's somewhere there's a black slave in her lineage. So he needed his white mum to be black enough in this concept, and and it's all it is. Nothing is clear. Katza Shashwati is right, but she's also wrong. So she mm -hmm. she should have to, what she should do is change the system and she changes her body. <laughs> she, mm -hmm. she takes a shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another thing uh, that stands out to me in this scene is um, Nivedita's um, relationship to her father. So, um, and just how different generations in the diaspora uh, think about racism in different ways, right? So her father saying we had real racism, not what you're dealing with now. So is do you think that is common that we have this kind of generational divide when it comes to how one understands what racism is or or to what extent the world is post-racial? You know? um, I think on many levels, yes. I mean, this is a scene that was very condensed. So everybody says, Duh, we experienced real racism. You didn't. And they're all right and they're all wrong because they don't see that mm -hmm. just because what you experienced was awful doesn't mean, or was worse, doesn't mean that what she's experienced is less. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also that he's her father. So he came to Germany and he was happy to work for less money than his colleagues in the same job and he was happy mm -hmm. being able to do that so she's a different generation she says but but I've got right to 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 same same uh, same treatment to equality and all this so it's a different discourse and it's also it is painful for parents to experience their their children race racist um um experiences i mean i'm i'm a mother and it is much harder for me because um i know i can deal with things but when my kids experience racism and um and and they do it is it, it hurts me so much more and for that generation that has not have a language so we didn't talk about this at all in germany so they had to do it individually so one of the things that you can deal with is, is just say it doesn't happen it's so nice that it's so much better because that's what they want to see. And it's true. It is a lot better. It just doesn't mean there's no racism anymore. A lot has happened. You haven't fought for nothing, obviously. Yeah, I completely agree, um, especially with you know, what it's like to be a mother and deal with racism because I, so my, the first time I went to Germany, I was, you know, a 20 something year old exchange student. And when I returned, I was a mother with like a four-year-old and the experience was completely different because suddenly people are shoving your kid. Oh, you're walking too slow and thinking he's going to steal toys in the toy store. And it, it just, it hurts so much to see other people racializing him compared to like me just dealing with people and saying, oh, they're just stupid. You know, I'm going to ignore them. So, um, and what was interesting is that gender played a different role in this. So mm -hmm. I grew up and there was no language for racism. So um, feminism gave me a language for um, systemic um, discrimination and, and quite a lot was, well, you could kind of use it for other kinds of isms so like racism mm -hmm. and it didn't. But um, having kids, so I've got a boy and a girl. And so my son experienced this a lot I wouldn't say more but a different kind of racism as being a boy and, and not being white and being perceived as dangerous probably not as, as dangerous as your boy will because there's still kind of um hierarchy colorism right? absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. but um so so he is stop searched um by the police mm -hmm. Well, three times a week, probably all the time. Mm. My daughter isn't, uh, and all this. Um, so that was because I had grown up with with feminism, and I knew a lot about gender discrimination. Suddenly noticing that in the intersection of race and gender, what it means for non-white men, and 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 mm. and I hadn't reckoned on that before, and that that kind of opened a whole new world of wow. Mm. <laughs> also of. Of, of, of thinking about the world before and, and looking at the relationship my parents had because my mum always thought, oh, because he's a man, he thinks he's superior. And now I notice, no, my father also thought because she's white, she thinks she's superior. Mm -hmm. and, and quite a lot of the conflicts they had 
and I hadn't seen his side before until I had kids. <laughs> yeah, another, <laughs> that's really fascinating. Yeah, another scholar you mentioned at the end of the book is Bell Hooks, and, and I've okay. always appreciated her analysis of interracial relationships and, and gender. Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to, to ask uh, more about the, 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 the way the novel is constructed, um, specifically the, so the use of social media. Um, so I, you know, at, at the end of the book, you talk about, um, you know, soliciting friends to, you know, write tweets um, of how they would have responded uh, to Sharsvati. Um, and something there's, I think this is something Sharsvati said towards the end that really resonated with me, this idea that on social media, you can't be everything for everyone. <laughs> that you're, someone is always going to be upset at you. And honestly, this is why I've, kind of stayed away from Twitter, because I see how easy it is to upset people, especially, you know, when, you, when all these strangers can read what you write. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, on the one hand, so, uh, social media can be really useful um, for, you know, creating conversation and uh, a democratic, um, you know, exchange between communities, um, but it can also be, I guess, harmful, limiting. Um, so I wonder, where do you fall on the spectrum? What is your attitude about what uh, what social media contributes to these conversations? Oh dear. Um, oh God, where do I start? Well, let's start with the novel. So uh, the road of social media in the novel, the novel is called Identity and Identity is Nivedita's Twitter handle. So she's got a blog and she's called herself Identity and she blogs about identity politics and tits, uh, sex. Um, not even sexual politics and sex. <laughs> um, and so she she is a student, but she's got a big following, which she would not have in the pre-digital world. So her voice wouldn't be heard and her voice has got um, power that she doesn't know about. And that's also interesting because quite a lot of people at the moment um, who are very active on social media don't know. And because they have had the experience of being disempowered and they don't know that they have a power in the discourse now. And um, social media is incredibly useful for um, getting people to pay attention to things. And, and that's amazing. It's incredibly quick. I, I'm working for the radio. Radio is a lot quicker than, for example, print or, or even TV is even slower. So, but um, social media is so, so quick. And that is amazing. And it is dem uh, democratizing. So loads of voices are heard that wouldn't have been heard before, but not all. <laughs> That's another thing. So even there is a hierarchy on Twitter as well. And and how many, and not just Twitter. I've, I've used Twitter because um, most journalists are on Twitter and in Germany, um, we always think the world, uh, Twitter is a, is a mirror of the world, but only two, uh, less than 2% of all Germans are on Twitter. We don't know that because all journalists are. And so Twitter is incredibly powerful in how the press writes about things. Um, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't represent the people <laughs> as such. I have had the experience of um, quite a, 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 a really frightening shitstorm some years ago after I'd written the book about rape. Um, I don't want to go into details, but basically, um, at first, some some people from which I thought was my own group attacked me, which hurt me a lot more than the right wing people who jumped on the boat immediately afterwards, and and then sent me even I mean even the death threats and the death by rape threats were less frightening than that the people I thought were were my 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 clan. Um, that they were upset with me on social media. And um, so a lot of that was kind of uh, in hindsight research for the book because um, shitstorms do follow a certain logic. So they, they only last a certain time. So it's usually a period of two to three weeks and then they die down no matter how big the, um, the excitement was before, how big the scandal was. And it's also that um, they give you more attention. So it was incredibly scary, but afterwards my book really so a lot better than before um, because everybody had heard my name including internationally which they hadn't before and I think then I was asked to write for the Guardian um, and, and stuff like that so um, this kind of weird thing that even when the internet hates you it works for you I had the experience that at the same time there was a big love storm so loads and loads of people spoke up for me online loads of people wrote articles as well but the love storm online 
was overwhelming. So even though I I sometimes try to to be less online for my I, I read a kind of um, statistics somewhere that just watching the news, not even social media, just just media is worse for your health than smoking. And I do believe that. Um, and but uh, but but it's part of my job and it's part of the world I'm in. But you do notice when you speak to people, they're a lot more differentiated. They're a lot more um, there are loads of ambivalences in what they're saying and online they're not and that is a problem and I can still remember the day when the um when they changed from being chronological so the um um before I could go back and uh, who said what and suddenly um um the algorithm was what's important for you what's important and what is loudest and that was awful and that was kind of that was the day I kind of fell out of love with social media um, because then um, everything you thought was reaffirmed. So I thought, oh, I'm so right. And I, mean, I genuinely thought I'm going to write a radio play or feature about my incredibly interesting <laughs> Facebook um, story as a bare Facebook um, line history. And, um, and this will interest everyone because this is so. And then I noticed, no, they just give me everything I'm interested in and more of that. And that was that was a shock. So um, I also noticed how many articles I shared without reading them. And so if I do that, and it's my job to be a researcher and to be very thorough, it tells you a lot about what other people do. And I know about petitions I sign. I thought afterwards, I should not have signed this. And you can't, if you go back and then take your name off, it, it, it gets even worse. <laughs> it's just, it just get better. Yeah, yeah, I've been warier about signing petitions, but um, that's all, that's very useful information to know. If, if I ever find myself at the center of a shitstorm, it's nice to know that after two or three weeks, just kind of ride it out and it'll go, it'll be over. <laughs> it will be over and it will always be there. So um, somewhere in Twitterland, people say, me to Zaniel has said that it's brilliant for German women to be raped by immigrants. They didn't say immigrants. They used a different word, which I have not said. <laughs> this is what they made of. <laughs> Great. And so regularly somebody reads this again and is really upset about that. And they come to readings and say, but why did you say German women should, be, should have a great experience being raped by those men coming here wanting to rape our women? Yeah, no, no, you've you've definitely um, shown shown the ambivalences of of, <laughs> of social media. Um, let's see. I think you had one more excerpt from the book that you wanted to read, right? The lights, more excerpts, or we could open for the discussion. I don't know. Um, um we could do a, one more reading in German, and then uh, we can open the discussion, and we'll take questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to read you one of the tweets, uh, uh, none of the tweets, sorry, uh, one of the blogs. So, uh, I've got to find the page. I marked loads of pages, which is a problem because I marked too many. So, um, this is uh, Nivedita has just been called by Sharaswati, and so she's gone there to meet her. And, um, and, the first, no, I read you two tweets. So I read the first one and I jump to that one because they this is call and answer, so to speak. So the first one is the about me page of a blog. How can I mark this? Uh, <laughs> find the page. It's the about me page of a blog, and then we then we basically are introduced to Nivedita. I should have read this at the beginning, which I haven't done. So about me. Das letzte Mal, dass ich mit dem Teufel sprach, war er nackt, sichtlich sexuell erregt und eine Frau. So viel zu sozialen Gewissheiten. Wenn man sich nicht einmal darauf verlassen kann, dass der Teufel ein Mann ist, kann man direkt jede Form von Identität ablegen wie ein altes T-Shirt, was ich ja gerne tun würde, wenn ich eine hätte, die ich angeschweige denn ablegen könnte. Genau darum ging es bei diesem, wie jedem weiteren Treffen mit meinem Devil, der eine Devi ist. Eine indische Göttin mit zu vielen Armen und einer Kette aus den abgerissenen Köpfen ihrer Feinde. Ja, ich spreche von Kali. Nur mal kurz ein Bild von Kali. This is an image of Kali. It's at the cover of the book. Ja, ich spreche von Kali. Puh, 
alles Dämonen, sagte sie. In demselben wegwerfenden Ton fallen die meine Cousine Priti, pff, alles Männer, sagen würde. Und rüttelte ihre Kette, dass ihren erledigten Feinden die Zähne klapperten. Und tatsächlich sahen Kadis Dämonenköpfe alle verdächtig nach Männerköpfen aus. Doch die war bereits mit anderen Dingen beschäftigt. Lass uns um die Wette ejakulieren, wer am weitesten spritzt, hat gewonnen. Ich deutete verblüfft auf ihre haarige Vulva. Äh, wie willst du damit? Aha, nicht nur Cis-Männer können abspritzen, rief Carly und guckte dabei so triumphierend, dass mir einen Moment lang nicht einmal auffiel, dass sie gerade Cis gesagt hatte. Und warum auch nicht? Drei Geschlechter hatten wir schon Jahrhunderte, bevor euer Gott auch nur geboren wurde. Aber du bist doch meine Göttin, erinnerte ich sie. Ich dachte, ich wäre dein Teufel. Wo ist da der Unterschied? Race und Sex. Wann immer Kali und ich redeten, ging es um Race und Sex. Also in der Mangelung einer korrekten Übersetzung oder auch nur einer, die nicht sofort in bodenlose Abgründe führt, um mein Verhältnis zu Deutschland und Indien, meinen beiden Nicht-Heimatländern und um Sex. Dieser Blog besteht vor allem aus Transkripten unserer Gespräche und wenn ihr ihn lange genug lest, werde ich euch irgendwann noch verraten, warum ich mich die ganze Zeit mit einer Göttin unterhalte. Mein Name ist Nividita Anand, ihr könnt mich Identity nennen. And this is the blog where she gives the answer why she's always talking to Carly. Okay, das ist jetzt die Wahrheit, die ganze Wahrheit und nichts als die Wahrheit. Ich habe das Gefühl zu lügen, wenn ich ich sage. Selbst wenn ich über Dinge schreibe, die mir tatsächlich passiert sind. Vor allem, wenn ich über Dinge schreibe, die mir passiert sind. Weil ich dann in den Formen und Mustern darüber berichten muss, in denen AutorInnen das tun, deren Leben Teil des echten, weil vorstellbaren Lebens ist und deren Stimmen Teil des Kanons sind. Wenn ich also ich sage, lüge ich nicht über das, was geschehen oder nicht geschehen ist, sondern ich lüge über meinen Platz im Gewebe der Realität. Ich behaupte eine Existenz und eine Relevanz für mich, auf die ich keinen Anspruch habe. Ich spreche wie mit verstellter Stimme. Warum das so ist? Weil es Menschen wie mich im geschriebenen Universum schlicht nicht gibt. Zumindest nicht im uns bislang bekannten Universum. Die Schriftstellerin Sadie Smith erinnert sich daran, dass sie in ihrer Jugend als einzigen Leitstern nur den alten, abgedroschenen Pappkameraden des tragischen Mulatten hatte. Ich erinnere mich gut. Und erst an die tragische Mulattin. Oh Mann. Sollten wir es doch irgendwie in eine Geschichte hineinschaffen, war es stets nur eine Frage der Zeit, bis wir unserer illegalen Existenz ein Ende setzten, indem wir uns selbst umbrachten oder einen anderweitig tragischen Tod starben. Schließlich konnte nicht sein, was nicht sein durfte. Death by Unimaginability. Das erste Buch mit einem Mixed-Race-Ich-Erzähler war der Buddha aus der Vorstadt von Hanif Qureshi. Das war 1990, das muss man sich ja mal vorstellen. 1990. Und davor gab es uns komplett nur als Ausrutscher als Unfall, als Human Stain. Versteht mich nicht falsch, der Buddha aus der Vorstadt hat mir das Leben gerettet. Der Haken war nur, dass der Roman und alle seine Nachfolger in England oder in den USA spielten. Und ihre Ich-Erzählerin meiner Cousine Priti, hi Priti if you're reading, aufs Haar ähnelten. so dass Priti für mich immer schon deutlich realer ist als ich selbst. Deutlich mehr ich als ich. Deswegen ist es für mich einfacher, über Kali zu schreiben, als über mich mit großem M. Kali ist der Schall und der Zorn und die Heftigkeit, die ich brauche, um den Abgrund zu überwinden, der mich vom Erzählen trennt. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Um, I, I'm going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, you, you all can type your questions in the chat and I'll read them. Uh, while we wait um, for questions from the audience, um, since you, um, you know, read Uh, the blog post um, where Nivedita introduces her relationship to Kali, wondering, um, do you feel like uh, it would be appropriate to label the book Magical Realist uh, because of this kind of fantastical element? Well, it is definitely in so far as it is kind of um Uh, in this part, homage to Salman Rushdie and, and, and his magical realism. So you can't try to put yourself in any kind of literary tradition without referencing him in some way. And in this case, yes, 
and and obviously it's loads of other things at the same time i mean it's a campus novel which is not set on campus <laughs> it's loads of things which it isn't but it's definitely a story of passing the other way yeah um, let's see. Oh, Elizabeth, uh, I know you, you have tons of questions as well. So would you like to ask one while we wait? Sure. Um, there are, yeah, I really, really love the book, um, and so many aspects of it. And, um, while we wait for questions from the chat, uh, there's one particular that I'm curious to hear what you think about. It's, um, Parts of it has sort of a, a bit of a collage character, which I really appreciated because um, as Priscilla, Priscilla mentioned earlier, you ask people for how they would be respond in a tweet to the story of a professor pretending to be Indian but being white and so on. And so people sent you uh, tweets that they came up with and you integrated them into the book. And you have obviously this you know, made up academic Sharasvati and she has her made up, you know, the fictional books that are mentioned. And then you have real quotes from, you know, Arundhati Roy and James Baldwin, or at least you mention them. And what I, it's, you, you know, you quote the steel from the best. Um, what I really appreciated about it is that it sort of so very much sit, situates you in discourses. And it sort of seems to me like you're kind of, you know, weaving a web and also in a way creating community through your writing. And is that something that that sort of is a method for you or is, is that something that you were thinking about? Um, Absolutely. I mean, this was what I was hoping for. <laughs> so um, I, I wouldn't say I've done that, but this is brilliant if that's what it, what was the effect for you. So, um, yes, I asked people because the Internet is like one of the, the main characters in the book is the Internet. So it's like this Greek choir that always comments everything. And I can't write the Internet. That would be um, <laughs> hybris. And so I asked people who were active in social media, and, and writing on these topics and first of all ask people I knew and I thought I will ask other people and um, I ask I just write to them because you have this feeling you know them because you read them all the time and that was kind of overwhelming for me because a lot of them actually donated tweets and I thought brilliant ideas I don't have to write it myself that saves a lot of time it didn't so every tweet I had to talk to them for an hour on the phone or write long emails because the book wasn't there so they said oh I've got a tweet about it but it hasn't happened so what will people think and no no not on the in the real internet in the internet in the book but how do I log in no <laughs> no and so um it was really it was every tweet was so two lines were a lot of work but it was absolutely worth it because it's not just that everybody had a different stance on it. They were also, you hear all the different voices and that's amazing. And people recognize them because they, especially if they're there in, in these discourses, they hear their voices. And then they said, oh, me too, Zanya, such a good writer. She can imitate whoever you probably won't know them, their voice so well. But no, I didn't. They just wrote it themselves. <laughs> I didn't do that. Um, but the other thing that you mentioned is I wanted to situate the book in kind of real time because there is this magical element to it. So the, the, the supernatural element to it. And I wanted people to believe me in every other aspect. Of course, she's talking to a goddess. But at the same time, every book in the book, if it's not written by Shaswati, is a real book. Every quote in the book is a real quote. So it's a novel, but it's got a literary list. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's got a table of quotes at the end. It's also got one chapter that's told as a um, psychological text that you a test that you would find in a newspaper. So how brown are you is one of them, um, and uh, it's online. Um, uh, um, um, Masala movement they made um, an online version of it in German and in English, so you can do the test and find out how brown <laughs> you are. And uh, I really love that they did that very well. Um, I wanted to. Um, also, the, the names of the chapters. So the first is Fake Blue. So um, it's kind of every chapter is called After a Blue Song. Um, the second one is called uh, Post, um, no, Pop Post Colonialism. So every chapter is called after one of the famous books, like Can the Subaltern Speak and all these. Um, because the thing about post colonialism is it started with literary criticism. And that's the interesting thing. It started with telling stories and narratives and what kind of stories do we tell ourselves. And so I like to, to kind of incorporate that back, that back into a novel. And I also like this feeling of something is so much 
um, set in the now, so people read it and it reads like it's been written yesterday, um, not even last year, yesterday. And I like it because um, like when you read Sherlock Holmes, they're, they're using handsome caps and you don't think, oh, but we haven't got handsome caps, so we can't read these books any longer. Now we use taxis or Ubers or whatever. No, because it kind of places it at a certain time and it's got the flavor of that time. And especially in the discourse about race, a lot changes. And I wanted to kind of capture this. It's like a time capsule as well. And I like this about it. And I asked quite a lot of people who, to have cameo um, appearances in the book. So kind of um, um, le- most, now all of the journalists r- writing the book are uh, real journalists writing about these themes and I asked them and um, somebody um, has even donated a short article for the book and all this so um, I love this that it is kind of how fiction intersects with reality and and on one level I thought it was a big scandal the racial dollars of case was a big scandal in America would it be a big scandal here because we hadn't been we hadn't been talking about these things um, and it was also like kind of testing it would you really be upset? And, and I mean, now that the book is out and, and it's like discourse is kind of slowly, slowly, and then it has this um, exponential growth. And now I know it would have been very much the same scandal here. But when I wrote the book, I wasn't even sure about that. So it's kind of like writing to the future and hoping to hit the timeline in real time and maybe missing it. You never know. I actually, we... Thank you. Um, we have a question from the chat uh, from a person who wants to be anonymous. I'm wondering if you can speak more about the interaction between discourse on race and gender in your novel, particularly as it relates to how we interpret both as social con- constructs. As a white trans person, I'm often concerned by the way in which these concepts are conflated and or misapplied for instance, referencing trans experiences and analyzing figures like Sharasvati. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the ways in which this language is applied. Um, Absolutely. I mean, very soon into the book, um, the, the kind of hashtag of uh, trans race appears. So in ha- Sharasvati hasn't, uh, hasn't put that into the conversation. So it just appears because people do tend to say, yeah, but, but if you can be transgender, you've got to be able to be trans race. And um, there are similarities and there are dissimilarities about that. And so that played an important role on many levels because the term trans race comes from the concept of adopting children from visibly other countries and um, adoption plays a big role in the book um, it is one of the, the reasons in Shadowsati's history that she acts the way she acts so that is um, is that a spoiler I don't know <laughs> I might, it might be a spoiler it doesn't matter um, and but also because as the left we have or, or let's go back to the Rachel Dolezal case because when when she was debunked that was um, at the same time that Caitlyn Jenner was on the cover of I think it was Vanity Fair and um, the public reacted very favorably to Caitlyn Jenner obviously not everyone obviously but especially the left and the discourse and the media discourse was this is good and what Rachel Dolezal does is bad and there was it is interesting because um, the idea of gender is so if I'm I'm a woman or and if all my mothers were women, I can still have a son. So I can still, so it's a kind of thing that is um, negotiated fresh with every generation. The idea of race is that it's inherited. Um, so and and which is obviously a construct. And it's, it's they're both constructs, and we've got to talk about that there, but they are constructs that become realities in the world so because of racism and because of history so it's and Charles Whitey says it's just a construct and kind of yes but but it is a construct that has become a reality and you've got to deal with that as well and and they they've become different realities but in a world that is post-racism a world where all the wounds of racism have healed obviously it would be possible um, to do what Charaswati is doing, but may- maybe then it wouldn't be necessary. I mean, maybe that's, that's also um, an interesting thing. And and every everything she asked Nivedita, Nivedita hasn't got answers. So she says, yeah, but if I'd been born in India, 
and been white, like like Jenna Lumley, for example, you still wouldn't think I'm Indian. So if I've got an Indian passport, you still wouldn't think I'm Indian. So how can I become Indian? Where's that different from you not being allowed to become German? And, and she gets Nividita every time. And Nividita says, everything you say is right. What you've done is still wrong. And so, and, and Shalaswati tells her, yeah, but you've got to find a language for that. I want you to find a language for that yourself. I'm not giving you the arguments. And I was very impressed by um, Brubaker's book, Trans, and I read that and, and I used a lot of the book. And he really looks at the arguments. Why is it a different discourse about? Um, and he looks at all the arguments and, it is it is um, a fantastic book and, <laughs> and so um, it does play a big part and there is I think the question is important and the question is more important than the answer in a way yeah mm -hmm. uh, I think Teresa has a question um, Teresa do you want to just speak you can unmute yourself yeah thank you um, my question is about wellness and self-care in the book um and i sensed uh, also when you mentioned the Gwyneth petrol can candle um there is like this ambiguous relation to like uh cultural appropriation uh with like indian based practices of self-care and yoga and so on and um how shasvati's um position in that uh like accentuates that if you could elaborate on that uh, that is amazing there are loads of things i want to say so yes of course um so in in germany if you hear india you think of ayurveda and you think of yoga and then all this there's one scene in the book where nivedita it's a it's a flashback um and her her then best friend Lily uh, has a therapist and they meet the therapist on the road and the therapist says oh you're indian oh i love the indians they can breathe so well they're brilliant at breathing and Nivedita nearly chokes because she really doesn't know how to breathe anymore yes and this is one of the few autobiographical <laughs> scenes in the book by the way and um so yes so there is this idea of the other is only good if I can um um eat it or if I can use it to to have a nice bath or send smell it or, or all this but and there's always a but to this um lately so many really good white friends of mine have become yoga teachers and it actually made them more interesting people and I'm really struggling with this so I haven't um, and and also who am I to tell them you're not allowed to do something that's important for you it is it is I mean it's weird when when they do the chanting but but also but it, this is also it is also good i mean it, it is good that they they kind of immerse themselves in the culture so it is a lot about cultural appropriation and it's a lot about you've got to learn about cultural appropriation you've got to go learn about why it's a problem there's no right answer is are you allowed to do that or not i mean the police won't come right and, and, and so in a way so you are allowed to do it by law but you're not free from consequences but um asking the question opens up a line of thoughts that hadn't been there before. And so it's no coincidence that Charaswati is able to, in inverted commas, become Indian, while Nivedita isn't able, even though she is Indian, she isn't able, she thinks I'm not Indian enough. And so that white kind of privileged woman, it's a lot easier for her to, to take this and say, why not? Because yes, why not? Why can't Nivedita say, why not? And there are reasons for it, and there are historical reasons for it. And that's what I wanted to show. I didn't want to say, you're not allowed to do that. I just wanted to say, this is the background to it all. Um, Self-care also plays a big part because what Sharasati is doing, she's teaching love politics. And this also goes back to Bell Hooks, obviously, who is um, one of the big influences for Sharasati Gaiti, Chakravati Spivak is always one of the big, there are lots of influences, not just Rachel Dolezal to create this kind of super professor. And um, and she talks about love politics and says, one of the experiences that all, all discriminated groups share and inv individuals share that there was less and there was less love. So there was less love and less empathy. And it's not just something that 
white people think it's also what you think about yourself you you it, it it's not out there it's in here so racism isn't something we are out uh on the outside and it happens to us it's something we are it's like the water we swim in it's the air we breeze and so she tries to tell her students you are important you're important to me and she gives them all this this attention and then later on in the book so so um in one of the escalations she kind of swings swings all the way so she, so she says oh i saved you i'm your messiah and um you came to me you looked like nothing and you, just a couple of weeks in my in my seminar and you had your skin became clearer and your your hair became to, began to glow i'm going to sell my <laughs> my 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 seminar as a kind of cosmetic intervention which is ooh, wait here but it is also true because they felt um they felt right. They felt they didn't have to be something they were not, and um, and so it's it's the way it all goes together. And I, I I found the idea of the body very important because in loads of texts about postcolonialism, it's rarely about the body. It's rarely about intimate relationships, even though that's one of the areas. Where, where it plays out so much so this um this ex-relationship of hers um it is true in in the relationship with simon um she's absolutely able to be his equal and, and they're sparring but as soon as he says i'm gonna leave you um she hasn't got any armor because he's got the right to tell her you are important or you're not important and she she can't say wait <laughs> you are not the one to decide that and that has a lot to do not just with racism, obviously, but it also has a lot to do with her experiences of racism. That's one of the ways, one of the many ways that racism kind of um, intersects with all these intimate relationships. And um, I've been starting to do some research on that and writing some um, academic um, thesis about that and, and some essays on that. And so it is interesting how little research, there is research, but not as much as on all the other fields. And there's this lovely book um, by Alice Hastes in Germany. And one part of it is that she writes a letter to a white boyfriend. And she says, oh, um, you are not the first white boyfriend I've got, but I'm the first, I'm your first black girlfriend. And what that means. And, and that was a letter and, and I read it and I, I could find so much in it. And that was amazing because it is very different. And so my, my first boyfriend afterwards, he, he tried to find all the half Indian women in this. There are not that many. They're not, he really, <laughs> it was um, quite feet, so to speak. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, I'm looking forward to this book you're writing because I feel like also in the few um, representations you get about interracial romance, it's usually from the perspective of the, the racialized man and not the racialized woman. So I, I definitely think there's more room <laughs> for that <laughs> that reminds me of when i was reading swing time by um zadie smith and um her mum is black and her father is white and her friend says oh usually it's the other way around which is also it is a true sentence usually it's the other, and now it changes oh uh oh, i was gonna say there there is a question in the chat asking if you could suggest any more texts specifically about um, trans race. This is, this is from a student who's writing their dissertation about the novel and just wondering if you have any more recommendations for texts that talk about trans race within the context of critical race theory. I, I genuinely, I only found Brubaker and the book is called Trans and um, it is, it's amazing. It's a literary book and um, he is kind of, um, I think he he wasn't very much in the discourse about trans before, neither trans race nor transgender. And he makes it very clear at the beginning. And so he looks at structures um, and, and I found it very, very interesting. But no, I, I was, um, I mean, I was doing research. I had to resort a lot to articles, mainly articles about the Rachel Dolezal case. And everybody was kind of um, floundering. So so how how can we express what we want to express like like Nivedita is floundering um there are obviously um there is this book um it's called black for a day um that is about um 
passing the other way. It's about uh, it's it's a historical view on all those white journalists who blacked up and then went to the south to have the authentic experience of being um, discriminated against and then wrote after three days or three weeks wrote a book about that um, which became a bestseller and there are all these books um, so I read Soul Sister and I, I read oh god what's his name um, is it Black Like Me um, so, so I wrote quite a lot of those books and they are difficult and interesting and really difficult and so it's um, it's amazing to read a meta text about that um, um, but yes, there are, it is like, like we've always written about the other way. We could always understand why people wanted to be white. They, they had to die. I mean, they had to either die or it was always tragical. So I think Britt Bennett's book, um, the, the Vanishing Half, was the first book I read about passing where somebody just lived their life and said it was the right decision. They, they paid a high price for it, but they did did it and that was it and everybody else was kind of <laughs> it's awful isn't it um but that was new for me in the in the history of um of of of, of novels of passing like Nella Larson and and they always have to die they have to pay a high price for it um so um so yeah that's there's all this so something is happening here something is um is moving here and also Shazadi says at one point that she does not want to be white, that being POC in this case has become a cultural, um, 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 what's Währung in, in, in English, cultural um, um, currency. 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 Brilliant, thank you. Um, and that is true. And it is because it shows you everything is not happening simultaneously. So it's harder to find a flat or or to um, to get good treatment at, the, at, the, at any doctor or anything but at the same time especially in, in culture it has become a cultural currency and that means we have been successful we have we have changed the idea of what it means to be black or brown or whatever from being the other two um or, or also from being defined out of human to to something revolutionary and 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 dissident and all this while the the definition of being white which was basically coined the idea of being white was coined at the time um to um justify white supremacy and then white became the norm became invisible so we have no other concept of whiteness than white supremacy and so you've got to change whiteness and make it human too and that is really interesting because we have not touched that but we have touched we have we've done a lot of work on the other side and it wasn't for nothing well these are perfect words in conclusion <laughs> and we're out of time um so i would like to thank uh mito sanyal and and priscilla lane and teresa and uh, look out for announcements for fall because we are planning on more events. And I wish everybody a happy rest of the day or night, wherever you are. <laughs> All right. Thank Goodbye, you everybody. Thank you very much.